So let's suppose we have this block that slides down this ramp. And we're interested in finding the work as this block goes from what I call a point A right here to point B right at the end of the ramp. And we're going to say that this ramp has no friction on it, so the block can slide perfectly uh, freely without any encumbrance. What I want to do is find the work on the block as it travels from A to B. Now by definition, this work I can write as following. It's a definite integral of the force dot product with dr. When I say the force, maybe I should say the sum of all the forces acting on the block uh, dot product with a dr, where dr is just this... Uh, this this little tiny incremental change in position so as we go down the ramp uh, dr is sort of following the block and it's pointing in the direction always pointing in the direction of travel so whenever you're dealing with the sum of forces it's a good idea to put it in a free body diagram so let's go ahead and do that I'll label it FBD now if we look at the forces acting on the block what do we find well we've got the ramp pushing up on the block and it's acting perpendicular to the surface Right, there is no friction, so there's no force tangent to the surface. So let me draw this here. So there's normal force. And then I also have the weight, too, acting straight down. I just redrew those because I like yellow better. But anyway, here's the weight acting straight down. And I think that's all we have acting on the body, at least it's when, on, when it's on this part of the ramp. Uh, just for the sake of perhaps completeness, perhaps for the sake of making others feel better about it, let's also draw a free body diagram of the block when it's sort of on the upward slope over here, too. So again, we have a normal force ramp pushing up against the block. It's perpendicular to the ramp. And we also have uh, the weight, which of course is still straight down. doesn't matter what side of the ramp you're on. So now I will ask a question. Which, which forces among these perform work? We've got weight. We've got normal force, at least in two configurations. So let's start with the normal force. Well, if you look at our definition, our normal our definition of work has an integral which inside that integral is a dot product f dot dr well that normal force recall is always perpendicular to the ramp and hence it's always perpendicular to the path of the box as it's shooting down the ramp and that dr vector is always tangent to the ramp so these two forces n n here and dr are always perpendicular to each other so there's no work right and we can go over here it's still perpendicular to the ramp and it's still perpendicular to the rack dr is still tangent to the ramp again so no normal or the normal force performs no work now let's ask let's look at the weight the weight is straight down right and the dr a little bit of it points down and sometimes over here a little bit of it points up so in general yes the dot product between the weight and dr will be non-zero in particular when the block is moving downward it's moving at least part of it's moving in the direction of the weight so in that case the work would be positive. When the block is moving upward, then we, we have a, at least a component of the motion opposite the direction of the force. So in that case, we'll have negative work. So positive over here, negative over there. So in my table where I'm keep, keeping track of these things, I'm going to say the weight does perform work. And we'll say that sometimes it's positive and there's other places in here where it's negative work. So now let me clear the screen so we can actually do some calculations. So the work going from A to B, the definition is given up here, but let's now apply that definition. Uh, the force, the only force that performs work is gravity, which is minus mg in the j hat direction. And I'm going to take the dot product of that thing with dr. What is dr? Well, depending upon where we are, dr has a piece in the x and a piece in the y. That piece in the y could be either down or up. Or something so let me just write it very generally I'll say D I'll say dr is dx in the i direction plus a little dy incremental dy in the j hat direction like so and again we're work, we're integrating from position a to position B so now I can go forward and just apply my the definition of a dot product I can just work it on out so anything in the j direction dot anything in the i direction, that's going to be zero because i and j are perpendicular to each other. By the way, i and j are the usual horizontal and vertical pieces. And then I have this, the second piece, minus mgj dot dyj. That is going to be something. j dot j is 1. So when I integrate, I get the integral of minus mgj dot dyj. So this is just mg dy 
And notice now I'm integrating with respect to y all of a sudden. It was with respect to x and y simultaneously, but the x went away. So really I'm integrating from, I'll call it ya, the height at position a, to yb. And of course we can work out this principle, it's no big deal, minus mg, the integral of, of this constant with respect to y is just mgy, to apply the boundary conditions, which we, of course we can evaluate quite easily, which again becomes voila. So there's the work. Now something pretty remarkable just happened here, I'm not sure if you recognize it yet, but let's think about this block when it's sliding down the, sliding down the ramp. So at some point it's at right here, and the weight's, again, pulling downward. And some component of that weight is in the direction of, of, the, of the path. So this little component of the weight right there, that's the one causing the, the block to speed up. Now as the block gets into a steeper portion of the, of, the, uh, of the ramp, then I get a bigger portion of the weight pushing in the tangential direction, right? A little smaller piece in the normal direction. Now we have more acceleration. The block tends to speed up even more rapidly over here, where it's quite steep. And then we get down here, uh, all the weight's perpendicular to the ramp, right? And so nothing, so it's not causing any acceleration at all. And over here, boom, now I've got a little piece of the, the weight actually opposing the motion, causing it to slow down. So what's happening here, if we look at it from an f equals ma perspective, is it really quite complicated. The acceleration kind of starts off modestly, then it speeds up, speeds up, speeds up, gets going faster and faster and faster, because that acceleration is just getting bigger and bigger. And then the acceleration slows down, now we're moving upward, and we're actually slowing down. Complicated. And so if I were to integrate that component of the force as a function of time to get accelerate, to integrate the acceleration to find velocity, that would be quite a complicated integral. And what we're doing here is, is what? We integrate the force along the path, and things turn out in just a really wonderful way to turn that into just a y integral. And at the end of the day, when I take a work approach rather than an f equals ma approach, look what happens. My work is just a weight, m times g, times a change in elevation, right? ya is just the elevation right here. And yb is just the elevation right there. So ya minus yb, what the heck is that thing? That's the change in elevation. So ya minus yb is this thing. So my work is not some really complicated integral over some, some sort of curvy path. Instead, it's just mass times gravity times the change in elevation. This is quite spectacular. In fact, it doesn't matter what the path was. All I have is information about my endpoints. All I care is how high I started and how high I ended up. Doesn't matter where, whether this thing dipped way down below or just a little bit down below. Maybe it didn't dip at all. Maybe it's just a straight line path from A to B. In either case, the work would be mass times gravity or weight times the change in elevation. This is really profound. The good news, as, as far as solving problems goes, is that the, the work couldn't be easier to solve, right? Really super easy. Work, and if you're going from along some path that goes from A to point B, again, it doesn't matter what path you take in getting from A to B, that work is weight times change in elevation. Boom. Okay, so given that theory, let's finally work out a problem. So let's say we have a ramp, and let's say the block is initially released from rest, now uh, the block has a mass m, it's released from rest at a height h above the minimum point on the ramp, so we release it from rest, the block slides down the ramp, and whew, shoots right off. Maybe this is a ski jumper or something rather than a block. Ski jumpers are more interesting, right? Uh, but anyway, the ski jumper f uh, flies off the ramp, and what I want to know is the velocity of the block or the velocity of the ski jumper uh, when it leaves the ramp. Cool, so I'm giving you mg h d, d is that little height right there, theta is the angle of the ramp with the at, at the end point. And again, I just said that we start off from zero velocity. All right, so I've already give, list the givens and things we need to find. So I think it's time to jump into a free body diagram. So in work energy problems, we draw free body diagrams as well. So let's go ahead and start. Let's see, we've got the, the weight acting on this thing straight down. I'll say minus mg j hat if you like. I've got a normal force 
pushing that way. And this is the same free body diagram we had before. We know already that normal force does not do any work. So we'll leave that out of our formulation, but it's, it's, the, it's the gravity that does the work, right? Or the weight. So as always, when in working out dynamics problems, we state the physical principle we're using. In this case, it's the work energy principle. So the work in going from some point A to some point B is equal to the change in kinetic energy. And as I just said a moment ago, the only work is being done by the weight. Whenever we have a work done by the weight, you do not have to redo that integral. We've already done it before, so that's, that's knowledge that we possess. And that knowledge is that the work is m times g times the change in elevation. So I start off at some height up here. I go down all the way down at distance h, and then I come back up at distance d, right? But the total change in height is h minus d, right? And it's very important to check the sign. I'm starting up high, I'm ending up down low. I'm doing positive, or the, the weight is doing positive work, right? I start up high, I end down, up and down low, at the, so the block overall is moving downward. Weight is downward, so that's positive force, m times g, h minus d. And this is a change in kinetic energy, so this is uh, t at point b minus kinetic energy at point a. And there's what we got. So notice something happens quite nicely. Now I have to apply my boundary conditions essentially, right? I'm told that at, at the starting point, this thing's released from rest, so I have zero speed right there. If I have zero speed, I've got zero kinetic energy. So this leaves me with m times g, h minus d. Remember h, minus, h, d, m, and g are all given to me. That's kind of convenient, equals 1 half mass times speed at B squared. So therefore, speed at B is going to be two, check out this, those masses cancel out, right? So two times G times H minus D, and I square root the whole thing to get VB. Now what do you think, am I done? Do I have my answer? Let's be careful. Uh, I asked for velocity here, right? And what do I have? I have speed. Um, kinetic energy is a one-half mass times speed squared. Kinetic energy is a scalar, right? So I guess scalar right there. This is not a vector. Velocity is a vector. I just have a scalar speed. So to get the velocity vector, I have to know, essentially know its direction. I know the magnitude of the velocity. I just need to get its direction. The direction is in that the direction uh, theta relative to, or an, at an angle theta relative to horizontal. So therefore, velocity at B is equal to 2g h minus d, and it's going to have a component cosine of theta in the i hat direction plus sine theta in the j hat. Now I've got a, a vector which I can call my velocity. So let's do one last thing. We've got to calculate units, right? Make sure the units make sense. So units, I got a 2. That's nothing. G. G is a length over time squared. H is a length. D is a length. So I got a length squared over time squared. Woo. No. Ho, ho. Check this out. This is why we check the units. Notice I did something wrong. I neglected to include the square root in here. I'm looking at this result. I'm looking at length squared over time squared. That's not that's not what I want fat about velocity. What I need, or what I forgot to bring over, is that square root there. So when I do the units, now I take the square root of this thing. This is a length over time. That is a speed or a velocity. So I'm cool with that. So before we finish, let me make one more comment. Notice that by using the work energy approach in this problem, I can solve it with one, two, three, four lines of mathematics. That's it. And that's only because I wanted the velocity as a vector, not as a speed. If I just wanted the speed, it would have been done in three lines. The work energy principle makes certain problems incredibly easy to solve. This is cool.